Welcome to Rose Red Homestead. Today is the day we're going to do easy peasy plum jam. And we're going to learn a very easy way to deal with the pits because sometimes doing plum jam is really the pits when we have to cut them out by hand. So when we come back, we're going to talk just a little bit about the types of pens, a little bit about the science, and all about making jam and how to make it gel, and then we'll get right into it. So, see you in just a moment. struggle with making jam for years. Either it was too runny or it was like rubber when we were done. I just couldn't, I didn't get it. So these last few months I've spent quite a bit of time practicing and making jam and finally it has registered with me. I usually think in pretty scientific terms and so once I've figured out sort of the science of doing jam, I've learned quite a few things and I want to share them with you. The first thing I want to tell you about is about how um, it is that uh, when we make jam, it is able to gel. And that is because all fruits have a naturally occurring compound within the fruit, and that is called pectin. It is naturally occurring inside the fruit. All fruits have a certain amount of pectin. Now, some have more and some have less. Uh, our plums today have quite a bit of pectin, so that's a good thing. Probably slightly unripe green apples have the most. Lemons have a lot of pectin. On the other end of the pectin scale are the berries, raspberries, strawberries, blackberries. They don't have very much. And so a lot of times some of the recipes call for adding um, extra pectin, which we can purchase already made in the store. Now this is liquid pectin. It comes in a little pouch and you just open up this pouch and pour it in. Um, other recipes call for the powdered pectin and it comes in several different types of pectin. Now my personal pre preference is not to use any extra pectin at all and that is also a possibility. So as we proceed today we're going to go ahead and talk about the difference between when you want to use it and when you don't. But here's how this pectin works. So pectin is a compound in the fruit or you add extra com uh, pectin to your uh, prepared fruit mix and then you cook it. So here is how pectin works. Pectin will only do its thing, which is to form long strings of big molecules with sugar when there are three things in place. The pectin itself has to be in the presence of acid, sugar, and a high, high boil. If these three things aren't met, then it, you have trouble with it gelling to the right temperature. So when you use the pre-prepared pectin, you have to follow the recipe precisely. All pectin comes with a little fold-out recipe uh, sheet, and you look up your fruit, and then you have to use the exact amount of prepared fruit, the exact amount of pectin, and the exact amount of sugar. Now when you don't use prepared pectin, when you're just kind of on your own and let the natural pectin within the fruit do the thing, you don't have to be that rigid about your recipe. But one of the most important things is to be able to bring that prepared fruit to a high rolling hard boil and maintain that for a long time. So that requires the right kind of pan. So I'm going to show you some ones that are successful and, and one that particularly isn't so that that will help you judge which pan to use from your own kitchen or if you want to get a new pan it will help you make that purchase. Now this is the six quart pot that came with my set of pans, stainless steel, um, to go on my induction range. Now this has a nice heavy bottom. I've made many batches of jam in this pan successfully. The one drawback to this pan is it's short. 
And when that uh, fruit comes to that royal, rolling boil, it flips drops of hot jelly jam everywhere. And it doesn't stay on the sides of the pan. It splatters everywhere. So a lot of times I will put the lid sort of halfway on to block the splatters from going this way. And then I'm trying to stir here. So it's a little inconvenient. We're going to use this pan for something else in just a minute, so I'm going to set it aside. The next pan, and for a long time, this is, was my go-to jelly pan, and this is the bottom to my regular pressure cooker. Now this has a much thicker bottom than the other one did, and it has high sides. So this is a much better pot for making a jam as well. Um, we're not going to use this one today, so I'm going to set it over here. When I was doing research uh, for the last several months, um, I learned about what is known as a jam pan or a maslin pan, M-A-S-L-I-N. And these are smaller on the bottom than they are on the top. So because it has a wider top, uh, the diameter is larger, that allows the liquid to um, boil and steam escapes and then it thickens up quicker. Um, and I really, really like how these work, except this one is not a good example. Now, I'll tell you why. Uh, notice the difference between the diameter of the opening here and the diameter of the base. Now, when this is, this is a two to one ratio. The diameter here is twice as large as the diameter down here. Now, when I put this <clears throat> on my induction range, I got this from Amazon, and, um, and I was enticed because the price was great. This is a stainless steel pot. It comes with a really nice lid, a handle, a little pour spout right here. It appeared to be great to me, and I should have paid attention. My scientific brain did not kick in because the ratio between here and here is just too great. There's twice as much area up here as there is down here. And so when the jam boils, it only boils in that column and it leaves the whole edges not boiling. So I would stir and stir and stir and try to get the, the heated uh, jam over to the side and I could just, both batches that I made in this pot were runny because I couldn't ever get it up to a hot enough temperature. So I ended up using my six quart pan over here that I showed at first. Now, um, we do not accept any kind of kickback for any recommendation that we make in terms of products. We get a lot of things on Amazon. I like that because we live in a rural area and we don't have a large uh, variety of places to shop. And we can have things on our doorstep in two days, so that's really good. But we do not accept kickbacks for advertising Amazon or anything that comes on Amazon. Um, we buy everything with our own money. We don't accept free things in the hopes that we will recommend it. We think that that is unethical. Um, it is a conflict of interest. This way, we are free to say whatever we want to. And so, I do not recommend this pan. Now, I'm not going to tell you the brand name because I really don't want to bad mouth a specific brand. But this is the only one on Amazon in particular that has this two to one ratio here, so you'll spot it easily. Um, other than that, I could hardly get water to boil in this one when I was done. It was slow to boil. So this now is a reject, and I'm going to put it over here. I went back on Amazon. Now look at the difference here. The ratio here is 3 to 2, so um, the base is 2 thirds the size of the area here. I, I tried it out with boiling water, and the water boils all around. There were no places where the boil wasn't. And so I made my first uh, batch of jam in this last night. It is phenomenal. I love this pan. And I've even forgotten what brand it is and I would actually tell you. Oh, it is called Home Made by Kitchen Craft. Now this one was twice as expensive as the other one, but this is the pot that we're going to use for our jam um, today. So let's get to it. So luckily I'm wearing my jam making shirt 
I've lost about 50 pounds over the past year, and a lot of my previous clothes are much too large, and this is perfect for making jam. It's nice and baggy, so if the jam hits me, it's not gonna burn me, and if it stains, it's okay. So um, most of the recipes that you see online for making plum jam have one little line that says, pit and chop plums. Oh yeah, right. Don't you just love it? I looked at how they uh, suggested that you cut the plums, so you have to cut it this way on this side of the pit, this way on this side of the pit, then do the same thing to, in this plane, and then top and bottom, that's about six cuts, and then you're left with a little chunk of flesh that is still stuck to the pit, so you'll lose a lot of that flesh anyway. And so, those of you that have watched my previous videos know that I really like to figure out easier ways of doing things. So we are not going to do that procedure with getting rid of the pits to make this plum jam. So I have, um, our tree has just produced bucket after bucket after bucket of these plums. I think I've already done about six batches of jam. Now this is a little two gallon bucket. Notice that I don't have it filled quite to the top. And that is because when we make jam, we want smaller batches of five or six cups maximum of prepared plums. So we're going to do our pre preparation of these plums just a little bit different. Um, we're going to use this six quart pot. It is empty. It has no water in it. These plums I have already washed and I have removed the stems. So I am going to take these plums and I'm just gonna put them right in this pot whole. So there we have it. And there was just a little bit of rinse water that was left, virtually no water, because plums make a lot of their own uh, juice as they cook. So I am just going to put in maybe a half a cup of water. So about that much water is all, barely covering the bottom of the pan. I'm gonna put the lid on it and we're going to boil it and we're gonna cook these plums until they are very, very soft. So I'm gonna start those and I'll bring you back a couple of times during uh, the process so that you can see the progress. So we'll get started over here and I'll bring you back a couple of times. So you can see here, there's just juice building and building down in the bottom of the pan. If you can come see this juice building. And that's just from that little tiny bit of water that I put in. Also notice, it's boiling now. I have it on uh, medium high, and the skins are starting to turn loose. Now, one of the things that you really want to do with plum jam is keep the skins. A lot of the flavor is in the skin, so don't peel the plums first. But they're nowhere near ready. These plums are still hard. They're not breaking away at all. So we're gonna put the lid back on. We'll come back in a few minutes. They've been going like, four minutes maybe. We'll come back in just a little bit. Here's a quick progress update. Notice how much juice there is now. So these plums are very, very juicy. The skins are all loose. And the plums, notice that I'm just gonna mash this against the side. I can catch it. Okay, they're getting there. there it's, it's pretty easy to smash. So probably about another two to three minutes. When we come back, they'll be ready for the next step. Here's our pot, the plums are all ready, and I'm gonna show you that in just a minute. I wanna tell you what I have all ready to go, because with jam, things move fast. So I have the sugar pre-measured, only I've only estimated, so I'll get to what we're gonna do with this in just a minute. I am going to add the juice of one lemon, and that is to add a little bit of extra pectin from lemon juice, plus I like the flavor of lemon in my jams, or jellies, either one. And then the other thing is that um, you don't necessarily have to use fresh lemons like this. We just happen to have this. You can also use the, um, the bottled lemon juice that comes in the grocery store. So first thing we're going to do is get rid of those pits. And I hope you love how we're gonna do this. So here are the finished plums. They were just boiling away over there. So you can see that they're all juicy. They're floating in a lot of liquid that they made themselves. And the skins are there everywhere and the pits are still inside. So what are we gonna do with the pits? I'll show you. 
So you just take a hand mixer with this kind of a beater and turn it on low and we're just going to mix up the whole thing. This is where my jam shirt gets all splattered, but that's okay. And you remember what I said that in most recipes, it says to pit and chop the plums? Well, we're chopping them right now, and we're going to pit them in just a moment. Notice that you're not hearing any interference when these plums go between the beaters. The pits are not causing any damage. They're just slipping right through. Every time they go through, more and more of the flesh is being pulled loose. It's breaking up the skins a little bit. Making jam is a messy business. Okay, that's probably good. And you can see the skins as they have stuck to those beaters. So I want those skins as much as possible. So I'm gonna put those back in the pot and I'm going to put those beaters in the sink and set this aside. So here is the puree right here. The plums are all broken up and the pits are right there. So I use this little tool. I don't even know what it's for. I think I got it at Amazon several years ago to help me do a better job of, of cooking fried eggs or something. But a slotted spoon or anything with great big slots in it that will allow most of the stuff to fall back through is perfectly fine for this step. So what I usually do is I get a separate bowl and just put it right off to the side here. And then I just reach in. There's a bunch of pits. I don't want to lose all that good stuff. So I'll just knock them into this little bowl. Sometimes they just go right through. or they get stuck. And this process, and I have timed this process, takes only about five minutes to get rid of all of these pits. So I'm going to do that. Actually, I'm going to change hands. I think I do it better with, yeah, this is how. This is better. So then I can just keep the drippiness over the pan and slide those pits along here into this bowl. So th this works better. I forgot that's how I do it. So I just keep going until I get all the pits. So I'll come back in about five minutes when this piece is done. So this took just almost exactly five minutes. Here are the pits, and that was almost two gallons of plums, just short of two gallons of plums. Um, and I know about how many plums I need to make a batch that will be either five or six cups of finished uh, puree when we're done. So that's why I used that amount. A lot of times you just sort of have to guess it, but notice that this is just thick with skins, and I think I've gotten all the pits out. Yep. At least I hope so. Mm, nice and sweet. Now what we're going to do is, the last step is to, um, we're going to use the blender and just blend this up. Now I have used both my food processor and the blender because I wanted to see which one um, did the best job. And it wasn't the one that did the best job that made the blender the winner. It turned out being the one that was the least amount of cleanup. My food processor has about six parts that I have to wash afterward. This just has two. So I'm going to use this little tool again. I'm just going to stick it right here just in case I have maybe. In fact, I'm going to do this the smart way. 
I'm going to get it at a lower level so that I can see what I'm doing. And just in case there might be any spare pits in there, this will trap them. I am now thoroughly splashed with this plum puree. I don't see any pits so far. This is all good skin stuff. And I'm just going to blend this until the skins get all mixed up. That good flavored skin going on there. Oh, it would help if I would plug it in. That's all there is to that. And I'm going to pull my jam pan over here. Now, this one, you may notice, is, um, has measurements on the side that is so convenient. Because right now, the next most important thing is we've got to measure how much puree we have. Um, and then we'll have a couple of decisions to make. So I'm going to point this so that I can read it when I pour it in. This makes such a nice, smooth jam. Now, some people like those skins in their jam. I've done it both ways. We don't mind the skins so much. But I have to admit that um, it has become my favorite to have a smoother jam. So this will be the last. Okay, according to the measurement, I have exactly three pints. That is six cups, so that was a pretty good estimate. Now, here's where we need to make a decision. So, we have two or three things, two or three directions that we can go on this right now. Okay, number one, you can decide whether to stop right here, put this in the refrigerator, um, that's what I've been doing with my batches of plums. Sometimes when I get home from work, I don't have time to do a complete batch. So I'll get this far and I'll put it in the fridge until the next night when I come home. Then I'll finish that uh, batch of jam. And so this is just great to be able to have all of this lovely pureed um, uh, jam uh, stuff right here ready to go in the refrigerator and all of that work has been done. So that's one decision that we can make. The other decision now is whether or not to use the store-bought pectin or to just use the natural fruit pectin. If you use the store-bought pectin, this is what you have to measure very, very carefully. If it calls for six cups, we're good right here. And then however much sugar it calls for. Now, I happened to do a batch with the prepared pectin oh, a couple of nights ago just so that I would um, have that experience. And that recipe for six cups, and, and these are uh, sweet plums, and so the recipe was called for exactly six cups of prepared plums. That's what I had, and it called for eight and a half cups of sugar, and a fourth of a cup of lemon juice, and then one of those little jello sized boxes of pectin. When we finished with the jam, you could hardly tell what kind of jam it was. It, it was just sweet jam, but the plum flavor, that beautiful, tart, tangy, um, fresh tasting plum um, flavor was swallowed up with the sugar. So my rule of thumb is, however many cups of puree I have or prepared fruit, that's how many cups of sugar I use. So I was guessing with this sugar, and I thought, well, I have about five cups, so there's five cups right here. But just in case I was off on my sugar measurement, I had an extra cup ready, because I knew it would be somewhere between five and six. Then the other thing that I'm going to do is put the juice of one lemon in. And 
I'm just going to squeeze it right into the sugar so that when I add the sugar, I'm also adding the lemon juice. And so it saves me from getting something else dirty because I already have quite a few things that I'm going to be having to wash. And I use one fresh lemon with either four or five or six cups of the puree. And it just adds extra pectin. Now, with the store-bought pectin recipe that I followed the other day, I had to bring it to a hard boil and boil it hard for four minutes, exactly four minutes. And then I didn't have to test it, which is an advantage, I admit. So I didn't have to figure out whether or not it was ready. After four minutes, it was ready. So I just put it right in the jars. Oh, and speaking of jars, you may hear my oven on. I have our jars already over there in a 200 degree oven. Um, and that's how I keep my jars hot. I don't use the dishwasher. I like the oven because I set it on 200. And to sanitize things, to get rid of any um, microorganisms that we might not want, you have to bring it up to 180 degrees. So I just set it for 200 and I make sure that things are in there for 20 to 30 minutes. And that's about what those have been in, so they'll be ready. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and move forward, and we're going to use the natural pectin. So I use one-to-one -one puree to sugar and juice of one lemon, period. That's it. So we're going to move with our new pan over to the stove, and we're going to get started over there. I have everything all set up here on the stove. Uh, we're using WEC jars. And for those of you that may not know about WEC jars, you can take a quick look at our video on uh, water bath canning of cherries in WEC jars. I'm not going to take the time to explain, but here I have the uh, rubber gaskets that have been boiling. They have boiled for a couple, three minutes, and now they're in that warm water waiting. This is what I'm going to be using for the water bath canner. It's just a big pot that I have, and I think all of our jars will fit in here just fine. And then right here is the plum puree. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the uh, stove on, and I'm going to bring it up to number nine, and that is pretty high. So once this puree comes to a boil, and is going at a hard boil that you cannot stir down, then all at once I'm going to dump in the sugar with the lemon juice, which is right here, and then we'll cook. Now, the situation with um, not using prepared pectin is that you have to know what you're doing and you have to know the signs for when it is done. So I just want to show you right now how the jam runs off the spoon. It's really runny and it drips quite a bit. So remember that. I also have a couple of plates in the freezer so we're going to do a couple of different ways of testing so that we can um, get good indication of when it is actually done. And of course it won't even start changing until it gets hot and until we add the sugar and a little bit more acid with pectin with the lemon juice. So I'll bring you back when this is uh, just as we get ready to add the sugar. This is a hard boil now that will not stir down. It took about three minutes to get it up to here. My induction range in combination with this jam pan is fabulous. So I am ready now to add the sugar all at one time. So here goes the sugar and the lemon juice. Now I'm going to stir this in and when it comes back up to a good rolling boil then we start looking for different signs for the signs to change just a little bit. Okay, so here's how what it looks when it comes off the spoon. Lots of drips going down simultaneously. It's sliding easily off the edge. Okay, try to remember that because that's going to change. So we'll come back when this is boiling hard. So this is the hard rolling boil that cannot be stirred down. This is exactly what we want. Now, we don't know at this point how long it's going to take. 
Um, we just have to watch for the signs. Now, if you notice the boil, it's very lively. The boil, the uh, bubbles are kind of thin. And um, so when the boils, the, the bubbles start looking and sounding more like lava and start spitting little parts, uh, drops upward, that is going to be indicating a change. Now, let's just take a quick look at it coming off the spoon. A little bit of change. Can you, can you notice that it is thickening up a little bit? All right, so we're going to watch that. We're going to watch the boils. Now, when it starts splashing, I have to get some protection for my hand here. So it still may be five or ten minutes. So when it starts getting closer, we'll bring you back. Okay, the bubbling has changed, the sound is different, the bubbles are a little bit different. Let's see what the spoon says. Okay, so you can tell that it's getting more viscous. It's not dripping off the way it was before. Now I've just brought a plate from the freezer. Ice cold, so I'm gonna put a little dab right here. Let it sit on that cold plate for a minute. Notice that I have my hand inside this little hot pad, protecting it. Yeah, it's done. Okay, I'm going to turn this all the way off. I'm going to move this off the stove. Okay, now. Let me show you this little test. So it has cooled down now, and when you push it, if there are wrinkles in the front, that's one thing. Then you can drag a finger through it, and if it doesn't go back together, then that's a pretty good indication that it is done. So we're going to go ahead and pour this into the jars. All right, so here we go. These are WEC jars. I just got them out of the oven. We need to leave a little bit of headspace on these WEC jars. And this jam pan is so easy to pour from. That's what makes it so nice. And these are um, one quarter of a liter, which means they're just a little bit over a cup. Oh good, I'm gonna have a little bit left to go in these cute little wet jars. goodness, I'm going to come out just about exactly even. Look at that. Oh, now that is just plain lucky. I would like to claim my superior skill, but it has nothing to do with my skill. It was just plain lucky. So I'm going to grab a wet paper towel and wipe the rims, and then I'll show you how to put those together. This could just as easily go in ball jars if that's what your preference is. So here's how we have to do the, the WEC jars. So first of all, I will grab a gasket. And these jars are still kind of hot because they just came out of the oven too, I mean the lids. And so I'm just going to put the gasket on the inside lip and invert it. And then it requires these little clips. And I demonstrate how to do the clips in the other video that I mentioned, the one on um, canning, water bath canning of cherries. Okay, so there is one that is ready. I'm checking to be sure the gasket is flat all the way around. I'm going to need those in a minute. So here comes another one. Now, some people say that these gaskets are not reusable. Other people, this canning system has been used in Europe for 90 years, 
there are a lot of Europeans who say you can reuse them for about 10 times. So you can make your own decisions on that. I'm going to just experiment reusing them. These are all brand new, but uh, at some point I will be doing some experimenting to see if I can reuse them. But I do have some extras. All right, here's the last one. Making sure that it's flat all the way around. So I did buy the little jar lifter from WEC, which is much more convenient than the regular one. Not sure how many we're going to be able to get in here, but we'll see. I think I can do two layers. So we will let these process for 10 minutes. That's all it takes. It just needs to process long enough for the uh, vacuum to form. Now, a lot of times with jam, people don't even water, pre uh, water process these at all uh, because the jars are hot, the jam is very, very hot, everything is sterilized. And so that's what I'm going to do with these three little ones, mostly because there's not enough room in the water bath canner. So we'll be back in about 10 minutes after these are done, and we'll pull them out and see how they look. All right, I'm bringing the last one over. And here they are. They are just absolutely beautiful. Um, now, you're, I'm sure that you've noticed already but that it is not the same way of figuring out whether or not we have a seal because there's no little bubble in the middle that will pop down when the vacuum is set. So what is happening um, is that we have to let everything cool completely, probably overnight, and then in the morning we need to remove the clips. And this is, there are two signs for knowing that WEC jars have sealed. First of all, this little tab right here, this little tongue, will be pointing downward. Now let me get one that isn't sealed. So do you see how this one is pretty much pointing flat out, but this one is pointing down. That one is down. This one is down. So that's one way of checking. The other way of checking is after everything is completely cooled, like this wet jar of cherries that we featured in a previous video. Notice it does not have any clips. Now when a wet jar has no clips and there's no vacuum, this lid just lifts right off. So the way that we test for a vacuum is that we pick it up just by the lid. And if it holds, we know we've got a good vacuum. So in the morning, after these have cooled untouched all night, then what we will do is I'll come back out in the morning and test for the vacuum. So I'm pretty sure because there are already these indicators that there's a good seal because the little tongue tab things are down. I'm pretty sure everything is okay. And if they're not, we'll just put them in the refrigerator because they disappear pretty fast around our house. So this is easy peasy plum jam. I hope this is meaningful to you. I hope you can try out some of these techniques on your own. And I wish you happy canning, whether you do it in ball jars or the WEC jars. So thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you at our next video.